So first of all, pterosaurs aren't dinosaurs? Oh yeah, they're definitely not dinosaurs. What's up guys, Ben from the Ogden Dinosaur Park here. If you're anything like me, at some point in your life you've probably called these things flying dinosaurs. In reality though, they're not dinosaurs at all. I had the opportunity to interview our head of education, Jeff, to find out what makes a pterosaur a pterosaur. Let's dive into it. If pterosaurs aren't dinosaurs, then what are they? Well, they are uh, dinosaurs' closest cousins. Um, closer to them than uh, crocodiles are. And, well, birds. Birds belong in the dinosaur group, so pterosaurs also happen to be birds' closest cousins, but they're not birds. When did people first start comparing pterosaurs to dinosaurs and lumping them together into a group? Well, I'd, I'd have to say that uh, that would have happened when dinosaurs were first defined. Uh, pterosaurs were known to science uh, a few decades before uh, dinosaurs were. Pterosaurs were among the first fossil animals to really capture the public imagination. Uh, but dinosaurs ended up eclipsing them. And this would have been uh, kind of the mid-1800s and started with the Crystal Palace in London and the first real dinosaur park, uh, which was commissioned by Sir Richard Owen and sculpted by a guy by the name of Waterhouse Hawkins. And these sculptures totally took over uh, the public imagination. For those of you who don't know what Jeff was just talking about with the Crystal Palace and Waterhouse Hawkins as dinosaurs, the Crystal Palace is actually kind of an important piece of paleontology history. It was first built for the Great Exhibition of 1851, which was an exhibition of Industrial Revolution technologies. But three years after it opened in Hyde Park for that exhibition, they moved the palace to South London, and it was built by a park called Crystal Palace Park. And in that park, Waterhouse Hawkins' statues were opened up in 1854 to showcase some of the things that we had discovered about paleontology. And there were 15 different genera of prehistoric creatures that were unveiled there. And the knowledge that we had at the time of prehistory wasn't super great, so a lot of the statues are pretty outdated, kind of like our statue of this Allosaurus right here. And you can kind of think of their park as the original version of our park, but on the other side of the Pacific Ocean at over 100 years ago. But what's still really cool about it is that a lot, if not all, of those original dinosaur statues are still standing. And I'm actually going to turn it back over to Jeff now so he can tell you a little bit more about some of those creatures and why they're relevant to pterosaurs. Along with the newly named dinosaurs, you also had some of these old favorites, the mosasaurs, and he even did some pterosaurs along with them. So right from the get-go of dinosaurs and pop culture, you had them associated with all sorts of other prehistoric animals. And because they took uh, the popular imagination by so much storm and have done so uh, over the course of over 150 years, uh, nearly 200 years now, uh, you have a lot of people using the term dinosaur simply to refer to any kind of large fossil taxon. Sometimes people will call woolly mammoths dinosaurs. So what is the scientific difference between pterosaurs and dinosaurs then? Well, um, we'd have to start with the hips. Um, and what you gotta understand with the rise of the pterosaurs and dinosaurs alike is that they both show up in the Triassic period, which was after the worst mass extinction that Earth has ever experienced. As a result, you had all of these ecological niches that had been emptied and all of these uh, organisms that are just trying to catch up. And they ended up having to pioneer a whole bunch of new ecological niches as a result. Um, coupled that with the fact that all the continents had been kind of squished together into Pangaea, and the arms race became about transportation. Dinosaurs ended up one of the winners of that arms race because of an innovation where they put a hole into their hip socket, and that let their thigh bones sit 
farther into the socket where they could support a lot more mass. That's one reason why dinosaurs can get so much bigger than uh, the biggest mammals. Pterosaurs, on the other hand, did things a little bit differently. Instead of creating those hip sockets, they developed the ability to fly, which is a pretty cool way to get around, if you ask me. Now, their earliest ancestors were actually hopping around kind of like kangaroo mice, but by the time pterosaurs themselves show up in the fossil record, they fully adapted the ability to fly, which is pretty cool. And I actually want to show you guys how their wing structures are built because it's pretty fascinating. This is Rampharynchus. He is one of the earlier pterosaurs, a Jurassic pterosaur. He's actually the one that the Jurassic pterosaurs are named after, the Rampharynchoids. Now, if you look at his arm, you can see his arm bone, and this is just a statue, so this isn't scientifically accurate by any means, but you can see his arm bone goes right here, and then his claws would have been sticking out right here, and then the rest of this wing bone here was actually his pinky that he extended out to make the tip of his wing, which is pretty cool. They also made other adaptations to their wings that helped them to fly even better, but I'll let Jeff explain that so that I can get out of this water, because let me tell you, this is not fun to walk around in. Uh, so, for example, uh, if you look in their wrist bones, they have this kind of stick-like wrist bone that sticks out, and that's called the pteroid bone. And from what we can tell from pterosaurs that have had their uh, fossils of their skin preserved, that pteroid bone was a control for uh, what's called the propatagium. Uh, a wing mem membrane that stretches from the wrist to the, el uh, to the shoulder in front of the elbow. Uh, bats have this too, uh, so do birds to an extent. Uh, but with the pterosaurs, they were using that as an active flight control. And eventually, they got to a point where they could uh, control their attitude in the air without needing a tail. Uh, they got so good at it. So that's one of their innovations. Another one would be uh, where they took a belly rib that you'll find in crocodiles and dinosaurs and even to some extent in birds and um, modified it into a new hip bone called the prepubis uh, because they reduced uh, their, their pubis bone in order to get their hips to work quite right. For pterosaurs, when it comes to hip weirdness, uh, a lot of them ended up with hip sockets that point slightly upward because uh, that, uh, of the way that their wing membranes uh, attached. Now, pterosaurs are not defined by their hips like dinosaurs are because they had different uh, wing configurations and different lifestyles. So are people going to get fed to a T-Rex if they call a pterosaur a dinosaur? or a mosasaur, <laughs> a dinosaur, or whatever? Uh, no. Um, if you're talking science, though, uh, you do want to break that habit. Uh, the reason why we have scientific terms uh, is for precision of thought. Um, if you're calling a pterosaur a dinosaur, and it's clear from the context that you're simply referring to any kind of a prehistoric animal, eh, we've been doing that for a, a long, long time. Like, go ahead and call them pterodactyls, too. Right? That's, that's a common term for them. But if you're going to start talking science, you need to make sure that your language reflects the topic and that you're gearing your language towards uh, what you actually want to say in order to avoid miscommunication and misunderstanding. Uh, pterosaurs, from a scientific perspective, are very much not dinosaurs. Uh, anatomically, they're completely different, uh, but they do have commonalities, and that's why we call them uh, each other's closest cousins. Thanks for watching today, guys. We hope you learned a little bit more about pterosaurs and what makes them distinct from dinosaurs. For those who are still watching at this point, I don't know if you guys saw, but we just got monetized as a channel, which is pretty exciting. So feel free to join as a member of the Ogden Dinosaur Park channel. As a matter of fact, if you join, you'll be some of the very first members of our channel. We're hoping to keep growing, so hopefully that'll be kind of a big milestone. And if you don't want to join as a member, we'd still appreciate a like on this video and a subscription to the channel. But either way, thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.